Welcome to Epstein Becker Green's webinar, The FDA Regulatory Environment for Wearables, Implantables, and Other Digital Health Devices, the first installment of our Wearables Crash Course webinar series. We are pleased to have Epstein Becker Green's Bonnie Scott, Associate in the Healthcare and Life Sciences Practice, presenting today's webinar. Before we begin today's presentation, Please be informed that today's webinar is being recorded and that participant phone lines will be placed on mute throughout the program. You are also welcome to submit questions directly to the presenter following the webinar, and contact information will again be displayed at the end of the presentation. In approximately two to three business days following the webinar, Epstein Becker Green will communicate the availability of the webinar recordings and access to PowerPoint materials. At this time, I'd like to turn the webinar over to Bonnie. Okay, so to get started, um, I thought we'd just take a step back and figure out what we're talking about here. So digital health is where you have hardware and software and mobile connection and other types of technologies converging to create new ways to manage health and treat disease. So digital health technologies include wearables, you see some of these pictures up on the slide, mobile medical apps, health IT, telemedicine, really spans uh, a lot of different products. And if we just think about wearables in particular, these can range from things that are fairly simple, like Fitbits or other kinds of fitness tracking devices, to stuff that is a lot more complex. Um, they call them medical grade wearables. Um, that, for example, might be a wristband that can alert epilepsy patients of seizures. And there's a lot of benefits tied to these types of products. For providers, these technologies can help reduce costs, increase quality of care, and they also allow providers to um, deliver patient care that's more personalized, and there's been a push towards that uh, in recent years. Uh, for patients, using these products can help them monitor their health better. Um, and these products give us a lot of access to data about our health that we've never had before. And the digital health market has really been booming in recent years, and future growth is absolutely expected for the healthcare wearable market. Uh, in 2014, the market was valued at about $2 billion. By 2020, it's estimated to increase to over $40 billion. Um, mobile medical apps are also, we're seeing more and more of those. Um, in one study, they found that there's over 165,000 uh, health and medical apps. Health, I'm sorry, health and medical apps out there today. Um, most of these are not uh, clinical; they're more of kind of the general wellness, fitness, and diet apps. So, of course, companies that are developing these products are going to want to think about what are the relevant regulatory requirements. Is my product regulated? Is it not regulated? Is it subject to enforcement discretion? And what the first two are pretty clear, regulated and unregulated, is that this enforcement discretion category means that a product might technically be subject to FDA regulation, but FDA has specifically said we're not going to enforce our regulatory requirements um, on this product. Um, and we'll, we'll talk about an example of that later on in our presentation. So. You can go to the next slide. So the first question a company is going to want to think about when they're trying to determine if their product is going to be subject to FDA regulation is, does my product fall under FDA's statutory device definition? And the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act defines a device, as you see up on the slide, to include an instrument, apparatus, implement, et cetera, which is in either intended for use in the diagnosis of disease or in the cure, mitigation, treatment, or prevention of disease, or intended to affect the structure or function of the body. And what separates a device from a drug or biologic is that a device does not achieve its purpose through chemical action or being, by being metabolized. And a critical part of this definition is and really the deciding factor as to whether FDA is going to consider a product to be a medical device is the product's intended use. So to determine what the product's intended use is, FDA is going to look at the objective intent of the manufacturer. So things that FDA will look at, um, what claims appear on the product's label? What do the marketing materials say? 
What are the company salespeople saying out in the field? Where is the product distributed? So all of these types of questions and factors are going to feed into the intended use of the product. And if a product clearly meets this device definition, it's very likely to be subject to FDA regulation. If it does not meet the definition, it won't be regulated by FDA. And then we have this kind of in-between scenario, uh, this enforcement discretion scenario that I was talking about before, where you might have a product that technically falls under this definition, but FDA has stated because the product is low risk, they're not going to enforce their uh, regulatory requirements with respect to that product. Now we can go on. So in early 2015, FDA came out with several guidance documents that kind of gave us some insight into how FDA is thinking about regulating different digital health products. And overall, FDA has taken somewhat of a deregulatory approach with respect to these products, which is probably comforting for a lot of companies. So if you look at these guidance documents as a whole, they show that FDA is willing to look at things on a risk basis. And FDA is not going to necessarily regulate every single product. What they really want to focus their resources on is the more high risk types of products and things that are really going to pose a real patient safety risk. But companies shouldn't really get too comfortable because despite this kind of deregulatory approach, the company really has to think about objectively the risk of their products. And they also have to realize that their, how they're going to judge their product's risk might not be the same as how FDA is going to judge, judge their product's risk. And, FDA's view might be more conservative. So I'm not going to really have time to go and comprehensively uh, review all of these uh, guidances today, but I'm going to kind of track through them and try to hit on the major points. So the first one is the mobile medical app uh, final guidance. So basically, this guidance says FDA is only going to regulate apps that meet the medical device definition that we talked about before, and that could pose a patient safety risk if they malfunction. So the guidance goes on to list a bunch of different app examples of apps that fall into each of the categories. So you have the regulated category, the unregulated category, and the enforcement discretion category. So if you are an app developer, these examples are really useful to see where you might fall on the regulatory spectrum. But if you're a developer, you're also going to want to look at FDA's different databases that they have to see how similar products to the ones you might be developing have been regulated in the past. So just to kind of give you some examples of apps that fall in each of the three categories. So for the unregulated apps, ones that don't meet the device definition, Examples of those are apps that provide access to electronic copies of medical textbooks, medical flashcards, apps that might be used for some type of physician office administrative purposes for like managing physician schedules. All of these things are unregulated. The next category is the enforcement discretion category. So they meet the definition of device, but because of their low risk, FDA is not going to touch them. So these would be coaching apps for patients who might have certain conditions, health tracking apps, apps that provide medication reminders uh, or medication tracking for patients. And then finally, you have this small subset of regulated apps that the guidance refers to as mobile medical apps. And these ones meet the device definition and they pose a patient safety risk if something goes wrong and the app malfunctions. So apps that are in this regulated category are ones that they might connect to a device and they control its operation. For example, you might have an app that can change the settings on an infusion pump or change the insulin settings on an insulin pump. Also regulated are apps that do active patient monitoring or that perform patient-specific analysis. So an example would be an app that calculates dosage for radiation therapy for a patient. 
you can see how those types of apps, there's a, a lot more um, chance of patient safety risk. Um, the next one is the MDDS final guidance, which is medical device data systems. So these are a subcategory of digital health, and the definition of these products is hardware or software that transfers, stores, converts the format of, or displays medical device data. So these products do not modify the data at all. An example of an MDDS product would be software that displays uh, a previously stored electrocardiogram for a certain patient. And because FDA views these products as uh, pretty low risk, it's going to, it says in the guidance that these products are subject to enforcement discretion. But you have to be careful with these products. If they're doing things like we talked about with the mobile medical apps guidance, if there's active patient monitoring, if the product is controlling how another medical device is functioning, Enforcement discretion is not going to apply, and the product is going to move into the regulated category. These next two draft guidance, uh, next two are draft guidances. The first two are final guidances. Um, the accessory draft guidance um, defines an accessory as a device intended to support, supplement, and or augment the performance of one or more parent devices. And a product is not going to be an accessory merely because it might be used with another device. It, the definition is very specific, and the term supplement and augment are defined specifically, so it has to meet the definition and the guidance. And again, just kind of stepping back, this guidance, again, is reflecting FE's overall risk-based approach to digital health. So FDA here is acknowledging that accessories may be lower risk than the parent device that they're attached to, so they might um, be placed in a lower regulatory class. Uh, finally, probably most relevant to this presentation is the wellness draft guidance. In that guidance, FDA explained that it wouldn't regulate general wellness products, which are intended only for general wellness use, and that present a very low patient safety risk. So there's two intended uses that these general wellness products could fall into. So the first one is related to maintaining a general state of health. We're encouraging a healthy activity, um, weight or sleep management, fitness tracking thing. So Fitbits would kind of fall into this category. The second intended use is um, intended use that associates the role of a healthy lifestyle with helping to reduce the risk or impact of certain chronic diseases or conditions. So an important point with this second intended use category is that in order to fall into this category, it has to be well accepted that a healthy lifestyle might play a key role in improving outcomes for the whatever specific disease or condition you're talking about. And there isn't complete clarity about what well accepted means uh, the guidance mentions the association between healthy, healthy lifestyle and the disease or condition you're talking about would typically have to be found in peer-reviewed peer -reviewed journals, but there's still not 100% clarity around uh, how well accepted the association has to be. So if we go on to the next page, uh, there's a flow chart you can kind of go through to decide whether your product would be considered a general wellness product. Uh, if you start at the top, if you're only making general wellness claims, so those types of claims would be claims to promote healthy eating, claims to manage stress, um, claims that your product promotes physical fitness. Uh, note that these claims don't talk about any specific disease or condition. So if you're limited to general wellness claims, you say yes to the first box, and the second box, you say no, so you go straight to the bottom. And the second inquiry you have to make is whether your product is low risk. So in order to be a general wellness product, you have to be low risk. And the guidance provides factors that make a product not low risk. So it says if your product's invasive, if it raises novel questions of usability, 
and your product is not low risk, it's not going to be a general wellness product. So examples of that would be lasers or implants, and the guidance provides a couple of other examples and guidance around how to make that decision about whether your product is low risk. And then if your product falls under the second intended use where you're trying to associate healthy lifestyle with reducing the risk of a disease or condition, you have to go up to the top of the flow chart and um, go down and see if you're meeting all of the elements in accordance with the guidance um, with respect to the type of claims you're making. And then you have to do the second part, which is the inquiry about whether your product is low risk. Okay, we can go to the next slide. So just to kind of summarize, I know we're almost out of time. We have three categories. We have the unregulated products that are not meeting the device definition, not subject to FDA oversight, health IT, medical textbooks, general wellness products, things like that. Then as we move over to the right, we have the enforcement discretion category. They might meet the device definition, but FDA has said we're not going to enforce our regulations for these products. So health tracking apps and patient portals and medication reminders and medical device data systems um, no, will not be regulated. And then finally, we have the regulated category, which is devices that meet the device definition and are to pose a sufficient risk to patients where FDA is going to be concerned about them. So these are like the more the apps that may control insulin delivery for an insulin pump or similar, um, similar functions. And it's always important to remember to go back to the concept of intended use. The same product can fall into a different regulatory category depending on how the manufacturer intends for the product to be used. So you might have a specific wearable that has a heart rate monitor function and can be used as a fitness tracker. But that same device might also be able to track and predict seizures in epilepsy patients. So the first intended use with the fitness tracker is not going to be regulated, but the second one very likely would be. So just a final takeaway, FDA has signaled somewhat of a deregulatory approach for a lot of digital health products, but companies still seriously need to consider what is the intended use of my product and they need to weigh what are the potential patient safety risks uh, when they think about their FDA regulatory strategy. Thank you, Bonnie. This concludes today's webinar. Her contact information is listed here if you have any specific questions. And in approximately two to three business days following the webinar, Epstein Becker Green will communicate the availability of the recording and access to PowerPoint materials. Thank you and have a great day.